Hello and welcome to the In Retrospect show. This is episode four and I'm your host, Sam Turner. It's a brand new month here for the show and as usual, I am in the company of the eminent Dr. Chris Darby, the Mr. Daniel Frost and just the plain old Peter Winnington. If you have the sharpest of ears and the keenest of minds, then you would have noticed that things have changed here ever so slightly at In Retrospect Towers. We never sit still and things have been shuffled, shaked and stuffed all into one super show from all of us. We have listened and this is the result. This is what we have created. To explain more though, we need a bit of exposition. And for this, I can now present to you a Daniel Frost production, which will answer all. Here at In Retrospect, over the past five years, we've brought you content ranging from retro reviews, gaming playthroughs, and examined some of gaming's biggest companies and franchises. However, times they are a-changing here at In Retrospect Towers. This month's show is the first in a brand new direction for the podcast, a direction we are extremely excited to finally share with you this month. From this month onwards, we are moving forward by stepping back. Rather than producing short, weekly podcasts, we're taking the very best aspects from each of our existing shows and combining them in a brand new, rebooted version of the In Retrospect podcast show. The team here of Peter Willington, Sam Turner, Dr Chris Darby and myself, Daniel Frost, are committed to producing content of the highest quality, and so we're pooling our resources to join together and bring you the very best that we have to offer in an easy-to-digest bumper monthly show. Each episode released on the first of each month will take elements from all of our current catalogue so we can ensure that all tastes are catered for. In the spirit of free play, we'll be taking an in-depth look at a game that won't break the bank, as well as sometimes highlighting some of the best content that the indie scene has to offer. If you have a game or would like to recommend a game you think we would be interested in, please get in touch. All the details on how to contact us can be found on the website in retrospectpodcast.com. Fans of our game-creating escapades will still be able to follow our progress as we continue to discuss and develop our title in this new show. For those new to the podcast, we, as a team of podcasters with virtually no experience in games development, are attempting to build and create a video game from scratch. All decisions are made on air so you, the listener, can join us every step of the way. And finally, for those of you looking for the intellectual stimulus you get from a Through the Reticule or Digital Wanderlust, you will also be welcomed into the fold as we will continue to explore the more diverse areas of gaming culture. In the past we have looked at topics including the concept of life and death in gaming, the psychogeography of the landscape of Arkham City, and how gaming can affect how we dream. All of our previous shows can still be accessed from our website, and from time to time we'll continue to publish individual shows, including in retrospect staples like the annual Christmas show, as well as more of the popular in retrospect specials. We'll let you know about these in due course. However, for now, we are excited to be moving forward with this new monthly show schedule. As always, we'd like to hear from you. Is there something in particular you'd like to see in this new show, or are there any topics you'd like to see us examine? Get in touch with us through the website or through Twitter and let us know your thoughts. This is just one of the improvements we are making here at In Retrospect and we look forward to showing you more in the future. Keep an eye on the In Retrospect Twitter, Facebook and YouTube pages as well as inretrospectpodcast.com for more exciting news and content. Marvellous! So we've had a little jiggle, a little juggle, and uh, this is the result. No more fumbling for the shows each week, no more constant updating every seven days. Now all your in-retrospect needs will be fed by this show and this show alone. Uh, Don't forget, incidentally, you can uh, subscribe on iTunes, follow us all on Twitter, and find out even more 
and in retrospect podcast.com it's a brave new world gentlemen and welcome to it it's time now though for this bong finish him bong gta makes us morally okay bong guinness winner wants a wallet that's not thinner <laughs> Bong. Fallout 3, devotee. Okay, one, um, if you're unfamiliar about what just happened, this is Chris's gaming news. Four gaming headlines delivered by Chris Darby. We get to pick two of them. Uh, this is news that's happened over the past month. Um, I'm voting for the... What was the third one, Chris? Guinness winner wants a wallet that's not thinner. Oh, my God. That totally gets my vote. Yeah, okay. What's this story, Chris? Um, this is um, well, well. Guess what do you think it means first? You've got to guess what, what you think. Guinness, wi- Guinness now Guinness winner. What, I'm assuming we're talking about Guinness World Records in one rather than rather than a sort of like winner of a pint of. Um, wants a wallet that isn't th- wants more money. There we go. Guinness. What's up? Okay, right. So what kind of? So it's a video game record. Yep. He wants money for re- like long. F- Fattest gamer wasn't wasn't GTA Five a record or something like that? Do they want do they want more money from us? Is this about it going on to PS4? Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. It's um, it's a guy called Michael Thomason who um, uh, is the Guinness World Record winner for the world's biggest collection of games. All oh, right. right. Um, right okay. Should we, do you want to have a guess on how much was in his collection? I say was because he's just sold it. How many I games? I saw a picture. How many games do you think Michael Thomas? Twenty twenty three thousand. Uh, four. Okay, it's between uh, one hundred and seventeen thousand four hundred and twelve. Okay, Dan's the closest. It's uh, oh, it's actually ten thousand six hundred and seven. Actually, I think Pete might be the closest with four. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. How was I the closest? I said one hundred and seventeen thousand. Yeah, it's ten thousand six hundred and seven. Excellent. So, right. Um, well, I won that. Um, he, and he sold. <laughs> <laughs> he sold them though. This massive collection. Well, not clearly not big enough for uh, Sam P. He sold it mm. for how many dollars? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with four, four again because that worked really <laughs> well. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah. Uh, Seventy six thousand. See, see, the thing is, I can't imagine a, like a video game collection actually being worth much. I think yeah. that you know, it's first of all, it's all old technology, and video games as a source are only meant to get better with age. So, I don't believe anyone who really wants to go back and like play um, the original Binatone um, TV versions yep. of. <laughs> football and all that kind of stuff yeah so i i wouldn't imagine that people are paying lots of money for this kind of stuff um i want to ask ten pete. ten thousand because he's got a few nintendo but, things in there but what about pete pete's got quite a quite a collection would you say going how many games do you yeah. reckon you've got off the top of your head uh it must be coming up on like five six hundred like and mine's not a huge collection by any stretch of the imagination like i've got like probably a fifth of that is fighting games like possibly or fighting game related stuff um but like people do play a lot of money for old games you'd be yeah. surprised like um i used to own S- castlevania symphony of the night and someone decided that they'd pay me like a hundred quid for it i was like all right mate i paid like well i stole it off a friend of mine so brilliant <laughs> you're like the robin hood of an- gaming. An- another insight into your your previous life as a criminal piece <laughs> yeah yeah basically but i mean like people do pay a lot of money for these things do you know what i'm gonna Depending on what he's got, and I assume that he's got like some of the classic. Like, it's a can, world record for the biggest amount of games. Then it's you've got to assume then, that he's, he's he's like collected them since year dot. And it's got to be know. some rare stuff as well, like the Nintendo Championship Edition. I can give you a list of some of these rare titles if you'd like to hear. Go, go on. He's then. got Dino Park Tycoon for the 3DO. Okay. Blue Thunder for the Action Max. Really? Yeah. Holy oh, cow! I don't know what any of those words mean. But um, okay. <laughs> NFL football, LA Raiders versus SD Chargers for the RDI. Really? Yeah. Oh my god! Um, just, just two teams. Battle Sphere Gold for the Atari Jaguar. Road Prosecutor. Pete, the Pete, Pioneer. hang on, hang on, Chris. Pete, can you explain why these are specifically interesting games? Yeah. Um, why so they? Why? What? What? What makes them? Worth? Each of them individually makes uh, has their own reason for being interesting, but um, generally it tends to be things like. 
a game will only come out for a day and then it will be taken off of like off of sale or it will be a game that was completely like never theoretically never saw the light of day and yet somehow managed to get into a, like uh, the public's hands so um for example the the classic example is the Nintendo Championship cartridge um those were only given away to people who won very specific events that Nintendo ran in America and they would get given a gold cartridge um and it was just like thanks for participating you won you know and there would be maybe three winners at an event and there were 10 events so like they're really rare right um and uh, so it'll be like a variant of something or it'll be a game that was unreleased and like somehow has managed to get into the public in in some capacity right so how so how much money did he make then chris he made he sold them for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars <sighs> Which is wow, which, which is roughly about four hundred and forty thousand pounds. Although Good to be effort. fair, the guy who bought it just needs to buy one more game to have the Guinness World Record. It's a very good point, Daniel. Very good point. He also sold his Guinness oh certificate as well. The reason he said he was doing this was it's... because he was he wanted to support his family. Um, he said he's had the same wardrobe for, since like the nineteen eighties or so, which is when he started collecting. He started collecting in nineteen eighty three, um, and he, basically he was just almost that was his life that collection essentially wow. and it is massive it is like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when you see it like on YouTube they haven't been able to take actual photos of it everything you get of it is generally a video which kind of pans around his collection as it were so yeah epic I, I like the idea of him supporting his family because for years they lived in poverty because dad just keeps <laughs> yeah. buying games yes yeah, so it's they basically like a stop buying, buying games <laughs> Michael <laughs> they lived underneath like PlayStation 2s <laughs> yeah <laughs> Huddled for there's a uh, there's a really interesting life well wasted podcast about um, games collections and universities trying to make digital archives Incredible. of um, of uh, of games that have since gone gone by. Uh, it's really worth a listen. Uh, it's on iTunes. While you're there, subscribe, leave us a review. Uh, Chris, um, um, ah, just one okay. more from you. Well, so well, what, what... well the, the first one was finish him. And that's finish with two ends. Finish oh, him. Oh right, I know. So this, this, this falls right cleverest. into this falls right into Peter Willington's lap uh, because I, I would assume that it's something to do with a handheld Rovio esque uh, deal. No, it's not actually. Is it something to do with a Finland character in Mortal Kombat? It's not. Mm. <laughs> is, is it to do with Mortal Kombat? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Scandinavian <laughs> okay, so... man. Is it anything to do with someone who's Finnish? It, it's it's to do with the country Finland and gaming. Go on, enlighten okay. us. Yeah, go on. Well, this is news that um, there's a, the Hearthstone gaming tournament in Finland, which is for uh, a new Blizzard card game. It's a tournament which is, acts as a, a qualifier for the International Esports Federation, which, as, as we all know, is based in South Korea. Um, they've caused a little bit of controversy for only allowing male players into the tournament. Oh, you see, now that's a very clever headline. Thank you. I, thank you him. very much. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, I spent all of last night, you know, tossing and turning in bed, thinking about what the headline would be. And I thinking about that. Finnish men. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I like the idea of you just <laughs> sitting really, up yeah. like at three in the morning. Finish him! Yeah. No, 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 the, do you know, did you hear about the reason that they decided to only make it four? Men? Yes, I did. But um, do you want to elucidate, Gungadin? So, as far as I understand, it's because women would be at a competitive disadvantage because they aren't as good at games. I oh, think that was um, like no. The answer they kind wow. of gave—they've kind of backpedalled a bit. But the answer they gave was actually—it's they not, not their problem, um, their, their fault. They say it's the actual esports federation, in South Korea, because they want to make it a sport like the Olympics. They want to treat it in the same way that sports do with physical ability events. Oh, right, so that's why they yeah. separate them in gender, but. It, it's kind of a you're losing it. You're fighting a losing battle here because one of the the kind of merits of gaming is that you you can play, anyone can play it irrespective of physical attributes. So mm. they're they're kind of they can't get the best of both worlds here really. And um, but, saying that, that um, but, only men can play card games at a particular ability to women is uh, a little bit of a, a misnomer really. That exa- exa- that divide is there because there is this there is this inherent belief amongst the esports community that women aren't good at those games like exactly. starcraft f- like female starcraft players are like one in um, like that are pro are like one in a million and it's all just you know nerdy white kids and asian like and asian guys just like, ha- like hanging out playing against one another like it just feels 
it feels so antiquated it feels it's it's definitely this this position of women in games and it's 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 becoming since the whole ubisoft um mm. debacle and assassin's creed unity it's it's really starting to become the the conversation again yeah and it really is just generally time to um to move it on i just don't understand i can i can see their point in terms of if you want to get legitimate legitimacy into sport then for the whole history of time there's always been that division in sport there's you know there's um men's football and women's football um and you know there's but that surely that would be down to kind of physicality differences whereas you could argue with gaming it's more it, it's not about physicality at all it's about mental um agility hmm. i don't there's... i don't need a strong thumb to be good at call of duty yeah. i need quick reflexes which... do, you, do you think and i'm playing devil's advocate here but do you think there's an argument to say that in a way that they're that they're protecting women by not entering them into this tournament because we've, we've all seen that footage of that guy at an esports event and if there's a woman who's playing games, does that make them a soft target for their abuse for the, for, for for attacking so them? That isn't that is an interesting theoretical argument to make because that community can be poisonous. But I suppose the I suppose the 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 two ways that you would come about at this would be well. Do uh, do these do people do women in general need protecting? And I, I guess the answer is no, <laughs> because they're human beings. And like uh, the other side of the the coin is, if that is such a poisonous environment, why is that environment not just changed so that everybody can take part in it? Like I would I would w- wouldn't want to get into competitive gaming because like if you've read competitive two D fighting forums, it is horrific. Like. And like, there's no way of actually accessing it. So when you, yeah, it, it just it, it just feels like it feels like an odd argument to make that is that is kind of steeped in history rather than based on something useful in modern day. Next up on the Retrospect show, we'll be putting a game made by Peter Willington through its paces as we take further steps towards making our game in time for Christmas. But first, it takes no change out of your pocket, nor does it charge a competitive rate of interest. It's free play. No matter what changes we make to the show, we can never lose that beautiful piece of music. Nor will we lose our boundless duty to bring you the best in gratis gaming. This month, we're storming the castle of Wolfenstein and taking on the evil might of Hitler. Or is it Mecha Hitler? It's kind of Ghost Hitler. And then it's Mecha Hitler. And then you just... It's still Hitler. And and then it's still Hitler with guns. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of... It's Hitler 2.0. Yes. Uh, and of course, you're taking on Hitler in the uh, id ID. That's another one. Id, id, hot potatoes. Uh, in the id software classic Wolfenstein 3D. For those unfamiliar with the legend, you play uh, the best named character in video gaming history, B.J. Blazkowicz, who is an American spy who's been taken down to the dungeons below Castle Wolfenstein. Wolfenstein 3D is highly regarded as the granddaddy of first-person shooters. And now you can go to 3d.wolfenstein.com and that will let you and all your friends shoot Nazis for free. In total, four different studios have tackled the Wolfenstein series with the most recent release earlier this year, Wolfenstein colon The New Order, being designed by those scamps at Machine Games. But things have changed over the years, and as we find ourselves travelling back and returning to what is regarded to be the game that revolutionised the FPS genre, Daniel Frost, I have to ask you, has much really changed for the genre since the game first came out? 
Well, I haven't. I'd never played uh, Wolfenstein 3D before. Um, and when we decided to play this, I was anticipating because I'm a quite big fan of first-person shooters. I was anticipating it to be really bad and quite completely different, and being like, "Oh my god, I can't believe how far we've come." However. I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed it, and I think the core aspects of a modern shooter are all there. It's a bit clunky because the the technology it's on couldn't help that, and all the problems and everything missing from the modern shooters is because of the technology itself. Um, I mean, right from the start, I very quickly became so accustomed to the controls that it was just almost like muscle memory, just like picking up. A normal, uh, a modern day shooter. Now there were a few elements like I can't look up and down and stuff like that, but I can look side to side and I can easily move around and I can navigate quite a complex maze. Is what you're in. Um, but I was really surprised that actually how much I'm not surprised it's called the granddaddy of first person shooters because so much of the the soul of a first person shooter is in this game. I, I really love this game. I'm, I'm I'm having a bit of a first person rush at the moment. Um, it appears that like I, I'm, every game I'm playing at the moment is first person based. I'm in that that zone at the moment, and I really really like this. Um, at face value, it looks pretty uh, really low quality. Looks very kind of as Dan said, a very rough around the edges, very stripped back, very minimalistic. But I found it a very supportive game. I really... Well, it's, it's not really been stripped back. No, no, but it feels Cause that, like... Because that implies that there was a better game out there and they just thought, <laughs> lads, lads, well, let's, let's get rid of all like, of this. I'm, let's I'm get trying... rid of all the staircases and all the lifts and all the, and all the pretty architecture. Coloured lighting in the bin. Yeah. Let's strip just, it right back. Let's just, get rid of shadows. Just we want, what, what we want are vases, German shepherds and Nazis. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm playing, for example, I'm playing Far Cry 3 at the moment, and it, I, it just, I, I, like as you were saying, Dan, I just, it didn't feel dissonant at all. I just went, I could go from Far Cry 3 straight into Wolfenstein 3D and not feel lost. Um, I loved having the maze. I, I, I was on it for quite a while actually. I had to force myself to kind of put down the game and go to bed, as it were. But I really, really enjoyed this game. I think for those who want to uh, witness the Godfather of um, first-person shooting. Then they really need to go to that site, and they really need to play this game. Is it mm. is it is it a shame, Pete, that not much has changed? Do you, do you think that shows a bit of a lack of imagination when it comes to the first person shooter? That, that twenty years, well, more than twenty years since since this was released, um, really the only technological advance that that has happened is that you can play it in a browser. <laughs> I think what it shows is that it was such a massive step forward and such a revolutionary idea for a genre of a game. Like, we often get new games that come out within the same genre, but we very rarely get games that are completely their own thing. Um, like, this is the game that started... Th it, 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 it created so many ideas. Like, the idea that you could move forward through a 3D space that you could side strafe that you had limited amount of ammunition that you had to move through a very specific maze uh, that there were different types of enemies and that they had different attributes and that they would attack you in different ways um, I think it's a testament to the quality of that game actually rather than a test, rather than sort of talking about what games are like today um in exactly the same way as, uh, you know, when we play a side-scrolling platformer like the original Super Mario Brothers and we go and play the, the latest Mario Brothers, you can still see that very vital DNA mm -hmm. uh, between the two games. You wouldn't call them completely different. Um, and I, I, I feel like the first-person shooter has evolved massively, but you can see the core of it in, in Wolfenstein 3D. There's also um, the death cam, which, was, uh, which is right at the end. If you kill uh, Hitler, you get a death cub. It replays it, and I thought that's a that's a thing that kind of mm. was only really picked up again with Call of Duty and popularised again then. Which I thought it's, it's such an interesting idea, which was at the time surely just meant to be put in there for gratuitous sake um, to relive the death of the Führer. Um, but um, it's actually quite a, a really interesting idea. Um, of course. The one theme that that has sort of popularised FPS, I don't know whether it comes from the fact that this is the grandfather, so therefore the lineage of such is passing through, is that the 
is that the warfare and and shooting and killing seems to be the most popular use of the genre. Chris, do you think that it, it's just inevitable that having a gun floating in front of you is the easiest way to use that to use that system of play? It's a very good question. It's one one thing I wanted to put forward. Uh, even though the mechanics may have been refined, has the storytelling become more nuanced and more complex, or is it just get from point A to point B? Yeah, because I mean, cause shoot it, cause to kill. It is, it, yeah, it's quite forgiving. I mean, you can shoot pretty far away from the from the enemies, and you'll probably still get one. So that's kind of been tightened up. So, so you just so do you think that the narrative elements of the game are pretty? Because it's a good thing about Wolfenstein is that you know what the narrative is as soon as you come out because it's it, they're Nazis. So yeah. it's, it's everyone it's, since 1950 has been programmed just to kill a Nazi on sight. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, a, a good example off the top of my head of an FPS genre that um, does something a little different, although it has got a shooty shooty gun in your hands, is Portal Two, of course. Um, um, Self indulgent, which I talked about in my latest podcast, Digital Um But um, but in terms of, and but also as well as being a shooty shooty game, FPS, um, it has a very interesting story. I'm playing Far Cry Three at the moment, and I'm loving it, but. It is not a very sophisticated story. I've just got to the point now where, uh, spoilers, my character has just said, okay, you ladies, you stay in the cave here, and me, I will go out <laughs> and protect you. Caveman-esque. It's like, really? Um, so yeah. I, I want something a little bit more sophisticated than FPS genre. Not necessarily just in the mechanics, but also in its narrative. And I, I, I'm struggling to think of any examples that have really rocked the boat in that regard. Because there weren't many games before Wolfenstein 3D that were about the war effort there weren't loads and loads of them and yet one of these first attempts at showing a war zone essentially or a, a, an environment of war it played it for not laughs necessarily but it didn't it made it an action movie it mm. it didn't it didn't try to make it hard and gritty and difficult that being said when i played it as a youngster the i went like it was the first time I was exposed to the idea of somebody dying in a, like those cages that hang from the ceiling with skeletons inside that you find in the game. Like that image really shocks me as a child. And like the the that ooh ha ha that sound when the blue guy when you see a blue guy or a blue guy spots you, like that became a bit of a running joke in my family because it was that's that sound made me made me think to myself oh my god like I'm, I'm about to be super overpowered here um but I always felt that I was being overpowered and that I had to fight back rather than like thinking about war in any way that kind of justified the act of war I love I love the idea of the Willington household being like a level from Castle <laughs> Wolfenstein we we all played <laughs> Wolfenstein 3D like uh, um uh, my father my sister and myself would huddle around the PC and we would play Wolfenstein 3D see, and it was awful. see my family would just play like Monopoly or Scrabble going back Pete to um our three game of the month uh Wolfenstein 3D 3d.wolfenstein.com uh, you can play it handily in browser um it actually is quite a technical achievement and I think it actually does it is quite brutal in a way um, is there anything that you didn't quite like about it anything that didn't quite strike strike with you I think I think I found the controls quite finicky yeah um, so the the major difference between the controls between like a normal a game that you would play today and a game that you played back then was that usually we have up, down, left and right or, you know, WASD um, that, that controls forward movement, backward movement and then side strafing left and yeah. right It was a but strafing this, that I found really difficult Yeah, the, the strafing is so left and right actually is turn the character pivot the character and unless you get down this slightly different um, like strafing mechanic of pressing two different separate buttons to actually do that it can be uh, a bit of a pain because what you want to be able to do is side strafe around a corner so that you can immediately, you know, fire round after round into a room rather than walk around the corner, hear the ooh, ah, ah, and then like you know that you're, you know that you're, you know, uh, in some serious business. Um, so I feel like the controls are a little bit of a throwback. Otherwise, though, as you say, like it is a technical achievement, both in terms of at the time it was a technical achievement because. 3D games were just 
they just weren't being made. But also in terms of like playing this in a browser, like this is a wonderful way to celebrate a series that, even though it never quite captured the magic of the original game, it's a series that has been going for years and years and years under different guises. And uh, like for it to be freely available for everybody, this little bit of history um, is available to play in a browser, and that's a techno like that's a technological, but also a uh, an in a sort of artistic enjoyment uh, achievement in that it's sort of leveled the playing field for for people who want to find out more about their history, you know, as part of a promotion for a new game. You may have forgotten that since the last broadcast of the In Retrospect show that in between getting married, buying property and generally living, we have been busy beavering away at making a video game. Since we last spoke, we've been working away in the background trying to advance our own game creation techniques. We've been using a variety of tools, including Twine, which was fine, Quest, which at the time was best. And this month we've been game testing Peter Willington's efforts using Adventure Game Studio. Uh, we'll pick that game apart in a second. Uh, but Pete, what was it like to use Adventure Game Studio? So Adventure Game Studio is really, really cool in the way that it's uh, essentially a halfway step between something like a Twine or a Quest and this like just super easy to use drag and drop and all that good stuff and something much harder like Unity or even something like a Game Maker. All right, so Twine uh, was very much kind of text links that would just basically send you to another hyperlink, which is another web page with text. Yeah. Quest was a little bit more dynamic in terms of creating a sort of uh, more uh, visually interesting space. So with Adventure Game Studio, you, you're actually creating sprites and... Uh, graphically interesting sort of yeah so with with quest what you could create is a text adventure or a game book with uh, adventure game studio what you can create is broken sword Mm -hmm. or monkey island or a visual point and click adventure um there's i mean people have made different kinds of games as well on top of that loads of different kinds but for our purposes kind of we are getting quite close to being a point and click adventure feel in uh, yeah. with what our game design is uh the the actual interface is fairly fairly intuitive in so much as it uses as much plain english as it possibly can so for example you have characters uh, that are referred to i believe as actors like that like so you know that your actor enters the room in a specific way rather than like go variable equals blah 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 oh, like, so are you doing much coding or is it so there is coding in there you can code if you want to uh, it has its own language but you can also just kind of drag and drop and use the the, the graphical user interface to, to create all of these things yourself. So um, whereas something like a Unity would ask you to point to you know a specific asset, which it would then display, you can just drag and drop an art asset and that's your background. And like if you want to create a walkable area, yeah. you just need to fill it in. Like, you know, literally with your mouse, draw over exactly where you want the person to be able to, your actor to be able to, to walk. So... That was quite useful. There are also some pretty good guides yeah. online uh, how to use them. The one issue I, I, I did find with the, the, the guides, just as a kind of side topic on this, is that they're not updated as often as you would like. So I was using a version that was maybe one or two versions ahead of the other, and there was a major revision fairly recently. And so I would go through these guides and go, right, well, how do I figure out, okay, so I need to do this, this, and this. And then the options to do the things that I wanted to do just weren't available anymore. They were called something else. Um, so that that was slightly disappointing. But I guess that's kind of... That kind of comes with the territory because this is an open source project. Mm-hmm. You know, Adventure Game Studio is created by volunteers, and I'm fairly confident nobody's getting paid for that stuff. So the the support for it as well is also community based, and it is a very good community. Um, so I created a prototype, uh, very you small, did. 
prototype. It's very small. I it was, is very small. It broke. It broke my computer twice as well, which is. Uh, Did it really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Amazing. So, <laughs> the idea is that there is an actor in the middle of. Uh, uh, in the middle of one room and either side of the room and these are obviously single screen rooms um, and there are there's one room to its uh, to the actor's left one room to the actor's right and you can hear in the audio two separate bits of sound and you can hear to your left that there is one animal chirping or squeaking or whatever it is and to your right you can hear a different kind of animal chirping or squeaking or whatever it's doing and if you go to the left, you will see the animal as a picture, literally a massive picture that I stole <laughs> from uh, Flickr or something like that. Uh, and the sound will be full on. So yeah. you, it, it's in both ears. And you go back into the other room and it's in, in two ears. Because so, we wanted this idea that you, we yeah. could navigate yeah. using these so, so So the idea is, uh, to, to briefly fill you in, that the, the premise of our game is going to be, um, uh, visually or not, more the exploration was going to be based more on audio than I think that it was going to be sort of visual clues whether there is something on screen or not uh, I think what we were trying to demonstrate especially with your prototype Pete is that that can work and you can have you start off with this with the, with the actor in the stage and just like alright I've got a sound to my right and I've got a sound to my left um, I want to go and explore what, what those sounds are where they're originating from and, and what that might lead on to and fair enough, in this prototype, all it is is a massive image of a blackbird and then two massive images of mouse, mice. So I think what your prototype proves, Peter, is that, well, in some sense, the word our game could happen. You can ex explore using sound is, is quite a, uh, an interesting technique. Um, I, yeah. I want to talk to you, Pete, because I'm, I'm a little bit behind you, because I, I too have started a template in um, Adventure Game Studio, but I've, I've mapped out nine rooms in a grid. Um, and at the moment, I've just managed to get it so I can, moving up in certain rooms takes me to the room I want to get to. Um, yeah. The next two things for me are to try and remove my avatar because I want to delete my avatar completely and see if you can still move um, without seeing them. But sound, how easy was it to kind of put the sound into it? So sound is fine. Sound is literally a case of using MP3s. Okay. Uh, to, and you, you cue the audio when you enter the room. So... The idea is that somewhere in, somewhere in the code, I think you can. There, there is definitely a graphical user interface way of doing this, but you cue it so that when the actor moves into the room, it plays the file. So like that's so to somebody if if somebody's listening to this and like is a coder, this is going to sound like really obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's stuff we have to kind of yeah, get yeah. our heads around, and it's something I I had to get my head around. So so the logic is when the actor moves from one room into another the audio stops in the room you've just left and is cued when you move into the next one um, and it links to a specific mp3 file that you designate and say like this is what what we want in terms of sound balancing I actually had to do that in the mp3 itself yeah. I couldn't figure out a way of doing it within that makes uh, perfect AGS. sense because that means you've got one file per room then rather than having two files yes. trying to play them simultaneously because I've got my sounds, but I, what I want to try and go for is to have what it sounds like four sounds, like top, left, right, and, um, and, to, the, and to the left. Um, yeah. so, the, um, so the player can hopefully try and differentiate between them to literally feel their way through based on sound, as it were. Yeah. So I think, I think that that's going to be totally doable. The, the way that we would get rid of our actor because I've kind of been thinking about how we might kind of get around this. I think what you have to do is replace the sprite that you're using to actually um, to show yeah. the standard actor. What you make is you make it a transparent sprite. Yeah, I'm, you, yeah, I'm trying you, to do You that. need something to actually move. Yeah, of course. But the other thing that you could do is... is so you, you make it see-through, mm -hmm. but you change its walking speed to, like, as fast as possible. So... You change the walking speed so that when you click somewhere, it will the the actor will walk to that location, but really it will look like a mouse click. Like to to the user, it will just be a simple mouse click of I want to go here. Yeah. 
um, and I'll be moving in first person or whatever it is. So we theoretically could do that by doing some sort of trickery, trying to trick AGS into thinking it's running a standard adventure game. Yeah. But actually, we're we're sort of masking it and making it sort of vaguely first person in some way. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I, I'm actually doing it through the arrow keys. So you move through your arrow keys, you don't click anything. Oh, wow. Because okay. I want them to really hear the sound and let that sink in. And, and let it take its time because otherwise you could beat the game really quickly yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so um, I really want to kind of let that linger um, I suppose um, um, so I, my next challenge will be to kind of get to your level and um, put the sound in that's the big thing I think the av- deleting the avatar will be the last thing to do because otherwise I'll just get confused I won't know where I am when I yeah, test the yeah, game yeah. out so yeah, I've got the sounds um, prepped I just need to edit them so I can play with the stereo actually it's almost by an hour i've got to make it three-dimensional it's not just the left and right it's the kind of it's the up and it's the forward and back for want of a better word that's kind of going to be really fun to play with and i I have got software that should allow me to kind of play with that but that's it's going to be quite a a juggling act but if i can see it as nine mp3s rather than um, um 36 um that's going to be a lot easier to work with I, I mean, I've not. I'm on. I, I use a Mac. I don't have a PC, and uh, Adventure Game Studio isn't compatible with Macs. Um, so, I mean, my question to you is in terms of the actual environment that we're creating. Uh, how easy is it to create, uh, for example, a, a more g- a graphical environment around you? Is that as simple as, in the same way that we're just saying you can put an MP3 on it? Is it as simple as creating a JPEG and being able to put that as yes. a wall or something? I yes. don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is literally. You can drag in an asset, and it will fill the background, and it will be your background. Um, the anim- like the way it treats animation is really cool as well. Like it, it, it gives you. It will say like, here's twenty frames of animation, like blank frames. Just fill in the information, and you can make a character walk. Oh, so it's like, like a stop motion type thing. Yeah, yeah keyframe okay. animation yeah. kind of thing. Key- so, so like that's a way of doing it. The the issue, of course, is that I can't draw. Like so, whenever I try to, whenever I try to make it fancy and try to put in my own actor, because I was just like, oh well, in this prototype, maybe I'll put in a cool character. Um, it just didn't work because I, I'm rubbish at drawing, um, and I completely got bored with it. Um, so not having any visuals at all is totally going to uh, to work in our favour. Um, uh, so it's definitely it's definitely a really cool working environment like to use um does it work does the actual the actual game making engine itself work on windows for mac it's i've 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 been trying to do that and that's where i'm i'm at a stage where it's a bit clunky at the moment i'm still trying to work out there are some few bugs i'm hoping i can get those bugs ironed out um but i've been using a program called uh, parallels desktop where you can within your mac you can run a a a partition of windows without having to turn everything off which makes it much easier to kind of work on um so i'm i'm at the moment with that and i have downloaded adventure game studio but whenever i try to use it there are bugs and errors so i'm trying to just kind of find patches and kind of search on the internet to fix those errors yeah i think it's going to be difficult moving forward the fact that we we might have to essentially lose one of the team to make uh to sort of help contribute to the game but uh, th- there will be other ways that I'm sure because of the way the adventure game studio works you know uh, it would be making uh, mp3s or creating jpegs or creating art assets that we can then all put in that seems like quite an easy an yeah, easy yeah. way that we can that we can go forward I think that um, uh, on next month's show we uh, uh, we need to do two things we need to um uh, d- develop this idea of, of of exploring without any any images at all, and see how that works. Just using sound as a as an exploratory uh, kind of narrative device. And I also think that we need to nail down what this what our narrative is going to be. We need a strong narrative thread, and because it's obvious from playing Pete's game that we need to use uh, Adventure Game Studio to limit our ideas rather than. Um, constrain those ideas to fit Adventure Game Studio. Um, so the the story arc needs to be there before we start putting things into Adventure Game Studio and realise no, actually we need to change that. 
rather than yeah. going this is what we can do now now there's the idea so uh, uh, essentially what i'm saying is we sticking with this snow blindness idea are we are we are we going to run with with that idea of someone being afflicted um by this condition of not being able to see um i think i think we do don't we and and i think really what we need to do is is figure out how long we want this game to be because i think even if you think that the game's going to be five minutes long or even like 10 minutes long the amount of work that's going to go into making those 10 minutes is going to be absolutely gigantic um so we we, i I think we need to kind of set i think there's a a temptation for us to go let's make a game that's four hours and like (laughs) Like, like it, it just won't happen. Like, just to produce that amount of audio would be it would be a, a, a massive task. Like, if we were just walking in a straight line. But the fact that we've got so much other stuff that's going on in the periphery, if we're going to do something that's about exploring, then like that's just going to you know uh, amp up the amount of uh, uh, of content that we have to make as well. So I feel like we need to we need to say like, how long is this going? Is this game going to be, and how do we fit the story into it? The story of snow blindness into it. Mm. I definitely think that a, a, a game of around sort of ten minutes long is fine, mm. um, because I imagine that the des- actual design of the game, the fact it's going to be um, exploring the environment using audio, um, the game might last ten minutes from end to end but you can spend time exploring things you can find and exploring how the audio is working if that makes sense yeah exploring the sounds listening because we could eat we could even put like arrow easter eggs in there you know there's, yeah. there's something quite i like the idea that each of us could record our own actual sound recording and and put that in there's something quite nice about having these four landscapes of our respective places where we live kind of all in this one game there's something quite nice about that i think that is kind of testament to the actual working uh, relationship we have with this project. Um, I'm going to go away then, um, not just now because we've got this to record, but I will go away and buoyed by Peter's game and the fact that it is doable to put sound in in an, easy, in an effortless manner as Pete shows, I'm going to try and do that myself um, with the uh, nine rooms I've got uh, presented. So, Chris, if we if you're gonna if you're gonna handle that aspect of like implementing how the sound works, does that mean that us three should go away and think about think about how the 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 story mm-hmm. or the 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 narrative should should figure and like actually get down some building but, blocks as to where we're going to move? And to? also the level design, like the way I've got it in my um, sketchbook, my in retrospect book, which I have for the shows. Um, I've got like your a gr- retro sketchbook. I'm straight. Uh-huh. By now, all stops last. Um, it's nine grids, and I've literally drawn. It's almost like the map of like Middle Earth. I've drawn like you know a river, forest, cave, all these interesting sounds that I want to kind of create. So the player can go, yeah, hang on, I'm in a cave now. Even though the landscape is still bright white, which I've got on my game, I can tell that I'm in a cave just by the sound of it. Um, and and kind of, oh, hang on, I can hear wolves over there. I I don't think I want to go over there. And just kind of feel their way through. So, trying to trying to create a landscape so that, that crosses these grids. So it isn't just the fact that the forest just stays in one grid. It may cross over several rooms, but um, but you're not just hearing a forest. You're also hearing the sounds of other grids elsewhere. So mm. it becomes a really densely layered um, piece. You're not just doing the sound of a forest in one square. You're also doing the sounds that you're faintly hearing that are like six grid six squares away. Say for example. So you can you can really go. Hang on, I can hear the sound of what we had originally was, you know, Christmas music. I'll head towards that. Oh, it's getting louder. But now I'm hearing f- the forest sounds coming in louder as well. So I must be in a forest. So I'm, there's a forest between me and the Christmas Carol thing. So it becomes quite sensitive in that regard. Just so I know we've talked. We know we're saying that there's no there's no visuals on this. I mean, I think personally, I think we'd need at least some visuals. And my thinking isn't necessarily kind of detailed visuals but even if for example if chris the, the square where you've got your river and a tree or something like that hypothetically if i were to do a jpeg of a river and then completely blur it and put like a white wash over it so you can just about make out some <laughs> kind of pattern that would imply that you can't see properly and that that could then 
affect how you see so it's, we don't have to worry about it being looking amazing because you're only going to see the faint outline of it and i think that would that be would, easy to do we that, wouldn't have to worry about things looking really really good i, I agree with dan um uh, I, I don't know if anyone's seen uh the uh, a game that's been released on steam recently called the tower the tower um i think it's i, I actually think chris it's a game that you'd enjoy uh, well, the idea of the tower is basically what we're trying to create. You go in, you're you're locked in a in a prison, and you escape. Um, but there's pitch, that there's areas of towers that are pitch black, and so basically you have to listen to sound and 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 sound clues, and cues, uh, to find your way through the pitch black screen. Uh, so I've I've watched several YouTube videos of people playing this, and it's it's not that interesting to watch because essentially all you're watching is a black screen and trying to listen to them navigate navigate through it. So I think that having slight sort of visual um, uh, assistance really helps because you can, like watching people play that and have that experience, you realise how quickly you can lose, you can disorientate yourself and, and, and sort yeah. of lose yourself and become, an, and it becomes uninteresting. I was, I was going to say, actually, like, it works really, really well because what we need from a gameplay practicality standpoint is an ability to say to the player you can't go further than this so so to have some sort of visual even if it is just like um, a lake in front uh, of the person visually we can just about see that that is something that we cannot cross but if you only have audio like how do you stop that person uh, yeah. how do you stop that player like continuing to go so like Yes, definitely. I feel like something, something there, uh, something visual needs to be there. Cool, cool. So this is how we're going to progress on. This is what we're going to do, <coughs> Chris. Yeah. Uh, you've you've already got that template of your nine things. So what we're going to do, yeah, is we're going to take on your we're going to take on your idea, and we're going to push forward to it because we're running out of time. So we need to kind of push forward with one idea, and then use that to hone and 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 add direction to it in bits and pieces. So we're yeah. going to take your idea of your nine squares. What you need to do is uh, uh, on an email. Uh, can you email uh, Pete, Dan, and myself the locations that you have in mind? These places yeah. that people are going to go. To. And you guys so can add to them as well. Yeah, we will do. Yeah, so yeah. email us the grids uh, and the locations. Um, these will all be put up on the site. Um, we'll add them into the liner notes. Um, uh, so you can see what we're doing. Uh, of course, we'll update you on next month's show. And so from that position on, we can start making those JPEGs those, for those locations. And also between us, uh, between Pete, Chris, and between Pete, Dan, and myself, we can begin to create a narrative of the reason why this person's here and the reason why he would go and visit each of those locations for, for whatever purpose. So that's the idea. That's where we're going to go with, uh, with uh, next month's show. So hopefully we'll have something to present. Uh, when we come and roll around to September the 1st. So that's it from this edition of the In Retrospect show. Thanks greatly to Dan, Chris and Pete for joining uh, myself. Don't forget that 3D.Wolfenstein.com is the website you need to play our wonderful free game of the month, Wolfenstein 3D. Uh, whilst you're there, open up a new tab and find us on Twitter, Facebook, Stitcher, YouTube and iTunes. Like, comment, retweet, subscribe and review at will. We will be back, as I said earlier on the show, on the 1st of September to bring you more news from Chris. Plants vs. Zombies will be pleasing your bank balance. Uh, you can play that for free at popcap.com. We'll also bring you up to date on the slow and arduous process of making a video game. If you want to get in touch in the meantime, just holler at inretrospectpodcast.com.